Good morning. Good morning. It is um, a pleasure for us to be involved in post Forest Games event. Those of us who have watched uh, Pope Francis over the past few years have certainly noticed um, the enormous response to him, both by those who are Catholic and those who are not. And his personality, his style as a leader, his way of engaging, not just his flock, but those internationally, has come under a great deal of scrutiny, sometimes criticism of the place. So this is certainly a timely topic, and with his visit to uh, Philadelphia in September, it is certainly relevant. What is more in the communication <coughs> department, we have, and this is something a little bit um, the distinction of being probably the only department in the country that has interns regularly at the Vatican who are involved in implementing the social communication policies um, of Pope Francis through the Pontifical House of Social Communication. So we feel uniquely connected to um, and excited by this event, and of course it's, it matters for us in terms of our curriculum, it matters for us in terms of our department of general pedagogy. I will say that um, as a communication scholar, um, both myself and those of us who teach in the department, believe that communication is enormously consequential. That is, we believe that communication doesn't just reflect reality, it's not just merely a description of reality as it exists, but communication is formative in constructing reality. In fact, scholars in communication across different sub-disciplines use this term regularly, that communication is constitutive, meaning that communication creates, it constitutes, there is a significant way in which social reality is composed of communication. And so while we often treat communication as um, a topic that if it's effective, it's transparent, um, and obvious in many ways. Uh, we believe it is, and um, our research source is much more complicated than that, much more complex than that, much more layered than that. And because communication constructs social reality, um, if you accept that premise as true, this means that words, and particular words of a leader, are enormously consequential. Not just for the organization she leads, or he leads, but for the kind of reality, the kind of culture of that organization. And so the presentation this morning on the communication style of Pope Francis helps us think about not only the words of the pontiff, but the ways in which those words don't just simply represent, but construct something. Last thing I'll say on this. Um, those of us who study communication who also study leadership believe that one of the most formative functions of a leader is how he or she uses discourse for framing, for framing. And framing means that you have your followers look at and focus on something. And of course, every way of seeing is a way of not seeing. So you have your leaders look at and focus on something, and that thing becomes enormously important <coughs> for the organization. The leader is also important as a storyteller. The leader not only narrates his or her own story, but narrates the story of the organization. And so when you put these together, um, communication is, is meaning-laden, it is consequential, it is constitutive. So for these reasons, we're very excited for the presentation this morning. I welcome you all. We're glad you co-sponsored. We look forward to a really interesting an intellectual needs to be that. As Peter helped us in the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in, uh, in Rome, and I'm uh, going to introduce Dan Potter, the professor. Let's give you a promotion then. Have you heard? First, Daniel Rossa from the Pontifical University gave us a, a, few bit, a little bit of information about the university. Yes, thank you very much. Introduction, and I'm also excited to 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 hear Fraser works. So. 
Okay, but I thought it would be interesting to give you a very short overview of our program in church communications, so you really understand why is Father John Block speaking about this. And I apologize, first of all, because of my English. I'm a, a Spaniard living in Rome, so you can imagine <laughs> all the languages passing through my head. And I speak Catalan as a first language. So okay. <laughs> then just a, a brief uh, data for our university. We are Pontifical University of Santa Croce, is one of the Vatican universities in Rome, with the traditional ecclesiastical programs of philosophy, theology, and canon law, but with a specific program in church communications, in which Father John and I work. In this program, we try to uh, form and prepare uh, responsible, communication responsible for church institutions of all kinds. Let's say, for example, spokespersons for the bishops, director of communications of religious congregations, editors of Catholic media, like magazines, newspapers, websites, advisor of, of council, advisors for communication to the bishops, uh, also including non-profit organizations. You think, for example, a Catholic university, a hospital, and they need people working in this area. So this is this is the focus of our program. This is small school. It's, we have around uh, the university as a whole has 1,500 students. We have 100 of them studying in communications. A majority of them priests, so coming from uh, all over the world. Really, it's very international, very international program. Like all the pontifical universities, coming to Rome for them is really. Uh, a, a, a great formation period because in Rome, besides the academics, you find really you you learn what's the church really in Rome because it's, it's the crossroads and, and the center of Christianity. And in, in the University of 1500, our program is just 100 students in the communications program. What happened? I mean, what happened? In, in our program is not a technical program. We don't prepare ex experts in sound or experts in camera. We prefer precisely director of communication, so people who think st strategies for church institutions. Because of the fact that we are in Rome, many journalists uh, work in Rome and covering the church, Catholic Church, Vaticanists, for example, and not only the Vaticanists, but all the journalists, come to us for questions, uh, uh, interviews. <laughs> so we have developed over the years because of the expertise and the fact that we are on the, on the right spot, let's say. Uh, these several programs for journalists, several seminars for journalists, that try to fill this gap, this lack of formation that many of us, many of them, excuse me, have in covering the Catholic Church. And where is uh, a Father John, Father John, who teaches literature, really, the program of Father John is literature and communication of the faith, has been very grateful because um, he's constantly giving interviews to media about. I mean, explaining, interpreting many times things that are happening in the Vatican and in the church or in society, but that are related to religion and to, to faith, etc. You have, I brought some brochures you have in these, in these folders, which I'll take when you leave and feel free to take some of them. It's just a small brochure of the, of the school and a, and a brochure of the program for journalists that we have around. So you have an idea of these kind of seminars that we have there for them. Okay, said this, which was just to give the sense of the, of the talk and why I'm here. I think it will be interesting to, to say something about John Wong, because he won't say anything about himself. <laughs> and mm, he's going to speak about the communication style of Pope Francis. I think it's certainly something very, very interesting and very new for in, 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 this, in this period. But John is, called, uh, is native from, uh, of Chicago. He speaks better English than me, don't worry. Uh, his background, he's a, a, a graduate at Harvard in, in literature and Renaissance history. Back, you know. And he was, and I, I think this is very interesting, before being a priest, don't worry, he was a political speech writer. <laughs> he worked for Governor Case, I think, and also for a general attorney, if I'm not wrong, before, but in different, two different positions. And again, as I said, he has a great experience in responding to questions, to media questions related to this issue. So I think it will be interesting to hear what my John wants to say, and then we can open time for QA, of course, about the talk and anything they want to know about the school. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, uh, Danny. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to be to be back in Pennsylvania um, after a long time, a long time away since I left uh, in '95 when Governor Casey finished his second term. Uh, that was when I moved to Rome. Um, the topic of the communication style of uh, Pope Francis obviously is a, a huge topic, but I think I wanted to approach it. Uh, so in a, in a general in a general way, trying to look at first the papacy, then the recent popes, and then Pope Francis, because uh, the communication uh, of a pope is not just the communication of any other person. It's a very unique institutional kind of uh, communication, and one of the things that we're we're seeing, I think, in today's world, is that uh, the papacy has taken on a, kind of an interest for the, the entire spectrum of the world, not just the Catholic world, right? And in a way, this is, it's, it's a novelty, but it's also been something that we've seen growing, I think, ever since John Paul II. Uh, and if you, if you go back a little further, uh, it's, it's quite surprising. If you think, you know, a little further, quite a bit further, uh, you know, in the year 1800, right, the last pope, had uh, just died in exile in France, kidnapped by Napoleon you know, in 1799. So that was the situation of the papacy at the beginning of the 1800s, kidnapped by Napoleon, dead in France. Um, end of the 1800s, uh, after you know, the, the removal of the, of the, of the papal states uh, by Garibaldi, you have the pope as the prisoner of the Vatican. Right? And the, it's an Italian state surrounding the Vatican that is quite explicitly ideologically hostile uh, to the church and the pope you know, refusing to engage essentially with, with uh, the world immediately around him. So exile, prisoner of the Vatican. And then you have John Paul II at the end of the 20th century who at his death is probably you know, the first citizen of the world. I mean, everyone turned out for the funeral, an international uh, love affair, really, that had taken place with with John Paul II uh, over over a very long papacy that was transformative in in many ways, uh, and certainly in his style of communication, which I'll I'll, I'll get into uh, a little later. Now, I think some people would say that under Benedict that changed. Um, but you know, I don't think it did all that much. Uh, in other words, the papacy continued to occupy a very central place in in the, in the view of the world, and despite the completely different style uh, of Pope uh, of Pope Benedict from John Paul II, even when he when he traveled, uh, his tra his trips were quite successful trips. Uh, people tend to forget just you know how surprising, for instance, the the very warm reception here in the United States was when he came here, his birthday party in the White House, all this, the uh, the the good feeling around around Benedict on his trips, uh, again quite surprising and counterintuitive. Especially there was a quite aggressive uh, negative campaign against Benedict when he went to uh, England. For um, and yet the trip itself was a huge success. You know, his, his speech in Westminster and all, and even the, the last great event, the World Youth Day in Madrid, which is a, was a, a very uh, successful trip. So I, despite appearances, I don't think that the papacy of uh, Benedict changed things that much. And now clearly with Pope Francis, uh, we're back kind of in a, a more of the John Paul, John Paul II uh, environment. The be especially even the beginning of, of the papacy of John Paul II, where there was just an incredible enthusiasm and universal interest uh, in what was then, I remember the a very young John Paul II, first non-Italian pope and all those uh, centuries, very dynamic. And so this, there's a growing uh, interest uh, in, the, in the Holy See, in, in, the, in the successor of Peter. You even see this in the media, uh, Professor Arasa and I were just uh, in Philly for the Religion Newswriters uh, Annual Convention. It's uh, secular journalists who write about 
religious topics. Um, there were over 200 journalists there in the Lowe's Hotel uh, to hear essentially a program, kind of a small version of what we do in Rome for one day, one day program, uh, you know, waiting to hear about Pope Francis and gearing up for, uh, for the trip. You even see in other in secular media like uh, the Boston Globe and, you know, in the last couple of years has started this crux website. They hired away John Allen, who was sort of the premier American Vaticanista, uh, to come start a site dedicated to Catholic news within the Boston Globe. You know, a secular newspaper basically creating a, a niche that is Catholic, Catholic news. And hiring John Allen, but also hiring uh, a young woman from Argentina, uh, Inés San Martín, to be in Rome, permanently in Rome. So they have a, the Globe has a Rome correspondent and John Allen, who lives in the United States and travels a lot, obviously, to Rome. Uh, Wall Street Journal in the last year also uh, created essentially a Vatican correspondent, Frank Rocca, who's a classmate of mine from college. Uh, uh, I've known him, <laughs> known him all his life. Frank uh, is the first you know, Vaticanista of a, of a secular paper in the United States. I mean, it, it, he's lived in Rome for many years, uh, a great journalist. But you know, the Wall Street Journal is dedicating an, an era when Many newspapers are downsizing. And all. The Vatican is on the map for the Wall Street Journal of all of all papers. That's part of you know. I think the, the situation is that there's a heightened attention to the, to the Holy See, and then you have I think I want to just very briefly talk about the different styles of John Paul II and and Benedict and uh, and Francis. One way of looking at it, this is a this is a, one of many ways to to slice this pie, uh, I, I think of them as uh, actors on a stage. Uh, and in the case of John Paul II, you have an actor who seems to be born for, born for the role that he's playing. Uh, he's on stage, he's aware that he's on stage, and he's comfortable being there. And he's comfortable talking from a position of, uh, of authority to the multitude, I mean, seem to be made to talk to crowds. You know, the, uh, the large gestures, understanding the theatricality also of, of his of his position. In the case of uh, of Benedict, it's kind of the the opposite. A person who's very uncomfortable on stage, acutely aware of being on stage, and not want <laughs> and didn't want to be there, uh, and was ready to to flee. Had the case of something of uh, stage fright. And then the, the curious thing with Pope Francis is that uh, he is, I think, not an actor. In other words, uh, he's on the stage, uh, but he doesn't seem to be aware that he's on the stage. And he acts as if he weren't. And yet it's extremely effective as, a, as communication, as, as, a, as a way of engaging. Uh, he is tremendously, uh, tremendously effective. He seems to, to be at ease, to forget about himself, whereas as you, could see, you could see Pope Benedict uh, as a communicator was thinking, you know, what do I do? <laughs> how, do how do I behave in this situation? And, all. and Pope Francis seems to have none of the, those concerns. There's no, he, is, he seems to be completely free uh, and unself-conscious and not worried about what people might think or is this appropriate for the, you know, the, uh, I'm the Pope, I, I shouldn't do that kind of, you know. There's a, I don't know if people saw this, it's a, it's a famous video, at least in some, in some circles, of Pope Francis one day uh, in the Wednesday audience driving around in the Pope mobile. And uh, <laughs> you see it, uh, you, have to, you have to know what, what's happening. You wouldn't notice it unless you were told to look for it. But uh, he's, he's driving along and he's waving to people. And then all of a sudden, as, he, as he's waving, he goes, Instantaneous, totally spontaneous, you know, and took a fraction of a second to do it. But what he he had seen in the crowd, someone with the, the flag of his soccer team, River, River, what is that? What is that? Uh, what is this? San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo in uh, in Buenos Aires, and uh, they had won Latin three one, three zero Latin the night before. <laughs> and, and, uh, he's kept, 
a, a completely spontaneous reaction, you know, and as I said, completely unconcerned about what people might think. Or the, you know, Benedict, you can't imagine. <laughs> he wouldn't know the soccer score, and he would never have done something like that. And I don't think, I think John Paul probably wouldn't have done it either. But that tells you, I think, something about the, the, the ease, uh, or that at easeness uh, of Pope Francis in front of, uh, in front of the crowds. Now, one of the things that's uh, interesting about the last two, about Benedict and, uh, and Pope Francis, is that I think in both cases, this is maybe counterintuitive, um, we're dealing with uh, types of humility, two different types of humility. Um, one takes the form of essentially uh, wanting to withdraw. I mean, I think Pope Benedict was probably, uh, this is a hunch of mine, I have no you know, inside knowledge of the Pope's mind, but as a theologian, I suspect that he was a little bit uncomfortable with the superstar papacy of John Paul. Uh, the whole sort of media hoopla around John Paul, it wasn't Benedict's style, and I think he didn't see it as entirely appropriate for the successor of St. Peter. And that's probably part of the, of the reason why he didn't behave in the same way. It's not, it wasn't simply a question of his personality, though I think that's part of it. Right? He was personally disinclined, but I think also at a theological level, he was interested in downsizing a little the, the aura uh, of the papacy. And I think also he would have been, as a, as a professor, someone dedicated to the truth, he was really interested in getting people to focus not on himself as a person. Right? You got the sense with, with Benedict that he would have been perfectly happy to write you know, the encyclical or the message or the homily, give it to you in, in an envelope, and you, know, you take it home and you think about it and you absorb it and it will do you good. Right? He had no, no, no interest in actually engaging at a personal level. It was here is the truth, you can forget about me. And I really think that, there, that is a kind of, is a kind of humility behind Benedict's, uh, Benedict's style. And even, even the fact that he retired. I was, I, I was talking with one of, one of the papal biographers uh, in Rome, a woman who knows him quite well, the correspondent of La Nación, the, one of the major papers in, uh, in Buenos Aires, is Elisabetta Piquet, uh, who one of her children was baptized by Cardinal Bergoglio, and, intimate friends, a uh, friend of the, of the Pope. But then uh, she wrote a book called Vida e Revolucion, Life and, Rev and Revolution of Pope Francis. And, uh, but she said, uh, I remember talking with her one day, and she said, you know, the most revolutionary thing that happened, this was last year, but the year before, was, wasn't anything that Francis did. The most revolutionary thing was Benedict. Uh, and the big picture, a Pope resigning, was incredibly revolutionary. It took incredible, incredible guts. And also, as I say, it's a kind of humility. The desire, he really did want to flee the stage. And in the end, he did. So he, he retired. Now, in the case of uh, Pope Francis, you have something completely different um, in terms of communication. It's not the envelope, here it is, read it, the truth's there, don't bother about me. And, and, it's, and I, would, I don't want to give the impression that Francis is saying, it is about him. It's not. And you don't get that sense with, with Pope Francis either. What you get the sense of with Pope Francis is, it matters enormously to me, Jorge Bergoglio, right, that you understand this. And my, I'm, I am emotionally invested in your understanding this. With, with Benedict, you didn't get that sense. There was a, a certain kind of distance, neutrality, perhaps even shyness. Uh, and exposing what you know, his his own inner uh, life, with with Pope Francis, you see it on the surface. This is what I want. I want you to understand this, and he says it in that in that way. And then the, there's a famous uh, audience uh, with the Pope where he you know, he basically was it was like a Protestant revival meeting uh, with uh, you know I can't hear you you know and it was uh, the living God is a merciful God. Over and over, Dio vivente misericordioso, no? and hit me. Say it again, right? I want to hear. I want you to say it. And over and over, the the crowd in the piazza shouting. I mean, as 
as different as you can possibly imagine from the style of, uh, of Pope Benedict. In other words, there's an openness of the, uh, of the person, Jorge Bergoglio, uh, enters into, in play in the communication, right? Uh, and that's very effective uh, as a style of communication. I mean, it's much more engaging, right, uh, than the professorial style. Of, uh, of Pope Benedict. I think this, uh, this accounts for a lot of the, the, the interest and the sort of immediate affection that people have for, for Pope Francis. I was, because uh, a lot of it is the, clearly in the style, in the manner, right, the attraction that Pope Francis has is in some sense, uh, pre-ideological, so to speak. It's not, when he, when he was elected, I was, I was there, I was with uh, ABC television, and uh, got a cab ride home, and I talked with the cabbie, always a good source, you know, and, and I talked with the cabbie, and said, were you there, right? Did you see when the Pope, the Abemus Papam moment when the Pope came out and all, and, and he said, no, I wasn't, but uh, I was working, but I was on the phone with my wife, who was at home, watching on television, and she was in tears. And uh, what's interesting about that is that, was, one, people weren't expecting Cardinal Bergoglio to be elected. He wasn't one of the top you know, candidates. Uh, most people knew next to nothing about Cardinal Bergoglio. And yet, he was immediately embraced, especially in Italy, uh, with an intensity that seemed out of proportion to what people would have known about the man. In other words, there seemed to be a hunger for something that was satisfied on the spot. Uh, you think, well, how could that be? Because it can't. They didn't, it's not that he, he said buona sera. He said good night. Right? That that's not going to do it. That's certainly not in Italy. It's the most uh, banal thing that you could say at that time of the evening. Um, and yet, as I say, it's a pre ideological. It's not. The, it's not necessarily about the content. It's about the style, the manner, uh, the sense of the person, right? That is so attractive. Now later, the, the enter, obviously, there's a lot more. But at the beginning. There was an immediate connection, and it had to do, I think, with the ease with which people sensed they could relate with him. Right? He seemed perhaps, perhaps uh, the father figure that people might, might have been looking for in a pope that uh, was somewhat, and somewhat missing <coughs> in the latter part of, of John Paul II's papacy. Uh, the persona was uh, perhaps hidden by the mask of his, his age and suffering and, and he was, he was unable to engage as much as he had when he was younger. Benedict was disinclined to engage. He came across as a teacher more than a dad. Uh, but Pope Francis was dad. He could, you could easily imagine him as a, you know, your own kind of father. Now, this, this ease of communication, uh, let's say naturalness uh, of Pope Francis, or even I would say, uh, perhaps it's a loaded word, but the democratization uh, of his of communication um, is a novelty, I would say, but it's also a really part of a continuum, if you think about it, that um, Pope, uh, Pope Francis seems to, to speak in a way that's less hierarchical. Um, uh, his pronouncements often are less in a, in a sacred or solemn solemn tone, but this already began with, with John Paul II. It was one of the striking things about these last three popes simply is the abundance of communication compared to what Pope, you know, Paul VI and previous popes were doing in terms of communication. It's night and day. I mean, it's an explosion of, of media attention and communication uh, on, on all the radio, television, trips, all the trips. Uh, we're, you know, we're talking about, you're talking about communication uh, constitutes reality. Well, the papal trips you know, are a huge part of that. Uh, the, they, they create a reality that is about the identity of the Pope. It's about the identity of the Church, the universal Catholic Church. It transforms the place where the Pope goes. Those, those are enormous uh, communication events quite apart from anything that's actually said 
just the, the mere fact of the Pope's presence communicates a great deal about who he is and what the Church is. And that begins with John Paul II and continued, perhaps despite his, his natural inclinations, under Benedict. And it hasn't stopped, even though Cardinal Bergoglio said he didn't like to travel. He always insisted that he was a homebody. And in fact, he doesn't go for, on vacations. He's sitting in Santa Marta right now, listening to you know, the radio or the television. Or, not the television. doesn't watch television. Music and a book. That's his idea of vacation. He's not a natural traveler, but he's doing it because it's, he, I, think, I think the experience of the first trip, the one in Brazil, convinced him that this was part of his job. This was needed. It was good, and he's going to keep doing it. So he's become a traveler, too, uh, as, as, as well as, as I think Benedict had to become a traveler. So there's the trips. And this is, this is I, I'm saying, about the sort of democratization of, uh, of the papal communication style. A major, major event in this, uh, people may forget about it, is John Paul II's interview book with uh, Vittorio Messori, um, an interview book of a, of a sitting pope, right? Where, and then the pope went on to write some books that were, you know, his own books as pope. They weren't encyclicals, they weren't papal documents, right? He wrote a book about his, pap his, his priestly ministry, gift and mystery, and things like that. But the first sort of crack was an interview book. It was a huge breakthrough, uh, breakthrough in sort of communications for the papacy. And then um, Benedict did the same thing. Benedict, and not only that, but then he wrote books as a theologian, the three books of Jesus of Nazareth volumes. Quite a striking thing with it, where a, a pope is writing a book saying, I'm writing this as Joseph Ratzinger and not as Benedict. And this is, this is very interesting about sort of downsizing, I'd say, the, the figure of the Pope, like anything that comes out of the Pope's mouth is somehow enormously a, a papal pronouncement. But we're getting, we've been getting away from that. We've been getting away from that for quite a while. I mean, it begins with John Paul II. It continues uh, with Benedict. And now, uh, certainly the, all, another part of this would be the plain interviews. Again, begins with John Paul II, continues with Benedict, and now... Pope Francis, who's even less scripted in, the, in, his, in his interviews. So the interviews with, with Benedict were prepared. I mean, he, he had the questions. and it, was, it wasn't a completely spontaneous situation. Uh, Pope Francis, uh, it is. But then you have beyond that, we're getting beyond that, we're getting into papal phone calls, papal emails, and things like that. And, and the Pope is leaving it unclear, essentially, and frequently, uh, whether he actually said the things that, is re that are reported. In other words, they're not even bothering to deny. So if someone says, the Pope called me and he said this. And everyone says, well, he said that, really? And, uh, and, well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. And, the, and Father Lombardi doesn't get up and, oh, no, that's absolutely not true what the Pope actually said, and as if it needed to be clarified. We're not, we're not dealing with that anymore. Maybe he said that, maybe he didn't. There's these famous interviews that the Pope has done with this Italian journalist, Scalfari, who's 90 years old and doesn't take notes. Right? And he did these interviews without consulting anyone. In other words, the Pope was basically in charge of his own communications. Uh, that's another interesting thing about this papacy. Um, is that uh, you know, and he sat down for two interviews, even after the first one, which was roundly criticized uh, and caused a lot of trouble. He did it again. Right? The, the Pope really I mean, it seems to be saying, listen, don't take everything you know, so seriously. You know, and it's, we don't know if the, if, this, if the things that Scalfrey said were actually said by the Pope. And Scalfrey even admits that it's kind of, you know, my impressions of what the Pope said. <laughs> Whatever, you know. Uh, okay. Um, one of the ironies of, of the situation in which we find ourselves is that um, Pope Benedict did have difficulties with, you know, communications. And be, be partly, as I say, because of his, his style and partly because some of the things that happened in terms of the... the the, the, the sex abuse crisis, at least the, the revelation of what, of what had happened, uh, a lot of that was coming out during his papacy. And as also the, the crisis with the, the butler and all these various things that went haywire the, during, the, during the papacy, coupled with his, as I say, disinclination to engage uh, in media relations, 
caused the Vatican to hire uh, you know, a specialist, Greg Burke, uh, who you know went to Columbia University, Columbia Journal School of Journalism, wrote for Time Magazine, has been in Rome. He's a, an Italian citizen now. Was Fox News was television correspondent and uh, someone who's enormous experience, professional experience in, in the in the sector, was brought aboard uh, and into the Secretary of State to help you know, strategize with about communications, and uh, basically within a year the Pope resigned, and then you have Pope Francis comes aboard, and essentially the problem that that Burke was hired to deal with. Was gone, and, and he said that. You know, what, you know, what is the strategy? I was get out of the way. That, that <laughs> doesn't have to do anything now. The, the Pope can't buy a negative, so at least back then. And it's a little more complicated now. It'd be difficult for him to get uh, negative press attention. So um, I think th there's a very interesting situation where there's an abundance of uh, papal communication or statements. Uh, some of them in contexts that are, would have been unthinkable. Uh, in the past, but their value as papal pronouncements is becoming less and less. Uh, there's, there's, there's been so much, right, that it's not clear what value has to be you know, placed on any given, a given statement. So we're in a, we're in, a, we're in a, an era of, of transformation, uh, I think, on that point. Pope is um, also interesting in that he, there's a, there's a large difference between his writing and his speaking. I don't know if people have noticed this, you know, the, the well, I, should, I shouldn't say speaking because his daily homilies are quite short and punchy. Uh, and in his recommendations in uh, Evangelii Gaudium, right, uh, he talked, there's a large section about how to do a homily. Uh, it's all about brevity. And, uh, and, and yet when he writes, the Evangelii Gaudium itself is extremely long. As is Laudato Si, the the, the encyclical. They're they're both very uh, verbose documents. So you, what exactly the the writing style of the Pope, as opposed to his uh, his homiletic style, are quite different. Uh, I'm not sure whether that means that. Obviously, everyone knows the Pope doesn't write everything. But, you know, so, so I my tendency would would to would be to sort of put the blame on that that the fact that. When he's preaching in those daily homilies, it's him. Right? Uh, what he writes in an encyclical Evangelii Gaudium is many hands. Right? Uh, and of course, he, he, he goes over it and, and writes some of it, etc. But it's a different style of uh, different style of communication and less uh, immediately traceable to uh, the mind of the mind of uh, Jorge Bergoglio. Um, last point, perhaps, so it was more interesting probably to have uh, questions. And I, I also wanted to say that uh, I'd be happy to talk about the reform of the Curia. I realize we're in a business school and questions of management and, and those things are probably of great interest here. So uh, that wasn't part of the communication style per se, but I'd be happy to talk about that. Last point is the one-on-one -on -one style of communication uh, of the Pope. Uh, one of the things that is a kind of a consequence of the fact that he's on stage, seems comfortable, but doesn't seem to feel as if he's on stage, looks as if he's not on stage, is <clears throat> the fact that he always speaks, or almost always, uh, in a kind of, as if he was talking to one person. Uh, now this has a couple of consequences. One is, uh, it was pointed out by one of the interviewers, of the Pope, uh, Father Spadaro in uh, Civita Cattolica, that if you look at the photos of the Pope, um, you know, if he's in an audience or something, he's never looking at the crowd. It's never you know, looking at everybody. Whereas with John Paul II, he did have that, you know, there was, the, there was uh, I'm here, and, and everyone's out there. And you know, Francis is always looking at somebody. There's always this, and of course, modern, you know, modern, uh, Photography is, uh, is ideal for picking this up. Uh, probably you wouldn't have noticed it, you know, a, a century ago, that the Pope was actually looking at someone. But that's actually, if, if, if you look through the photos, it, it, Pope Francis is talking to people, individual people, frequently. And I think he said it himself. He said it in that interview. That he's not used to, to to masses, to large crowds. One of the things 
that's a, a more interesting, I think, a consequence of this. The second consequence is that it affects the way he does interviews. He never did interviews as, as Cardinal. One of the striking things about Cardinal Bergoglio is a complete absence of interviews. He has changed, you know, completely his style of interaction with the media. In Buenos Aires, he was, you know, it was impossible, I've talked to lots of reporters, to get an interview with Cardinal Bergoglio. He, he did written, written interviews that I think were probably done by, you know, someone else in the, in the office of the bishop who answered those written interviews. But uh, he, did no, he was nothing like he is now. But when you see him on the plane doing those interviews, uh, I think it's instructive. Think as, uh, if, as if this was a private meeting between him and the person who's asking, him, asking the question. And I think it will shed light on the way he talks. And also on the content. In other words, he speaks, and this, is, this causes a certain amount of, I sometimes... Uh, controversy, and some of the controversies around the statements of the Pope, I think, are due to this. In other words, he speaks as, you know, say, I might speak, if I were sitting alone with someone over lunch, and we started talking about, you know, the affairs of the church, so I would say things in a way, in a, in a certain casualness, and perhaps also thinking more about how this person is going to understand it. In other words, if this person is, you know, not a believer, I'm going to say it in a little different way, and I'm going to use language that he'll understand. I mean, for instance, the thing about um, something very specific, uh, the question of rabbit, the rab breeding like rabbits line, the Pope, you know, someone was asked how many kids, you know, and, you know it's not as if you know, Catholics have to you know, be like, you know, breed like rabbits, which, you know, is, is the language of secular criticism of the Catholic Church's teaching in Humana Vita, right? And to hear it coming from the Pope, say, oh my gosh, you know, but of course he's talking with a secular journalist, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's sort of entering into how they're thinking, right? And I, I think that, that happens almost constantly when we're in one-on-one -on -one conversations. You're, you're, you're always modifying what you're saying to the, to the person you're saying it to. Now, when you're a pope, <laughs> and that comes out as sort of the official announcement, this is the, you know, this is the pope of the Catholic Church, it, it can be easily taken as a, sort of a, a, a statement of general principle, and, and that's how people, are, that's why I think, People are nervous about some of the things that the Pope says. But I think it really helps to think of that as part of his one-on-one -on -one style. And it, it, as I say, it's very, very present in the interviews, even this thing with uh, Scalfari. You know, he's not thinking in terms of the, the journalist, the 90-year-old journalist who doesn't take notes. Right? He's dealing with him on a one-on-one -on -one basis. He's an atheist. Right? Uh, and I, I imagine that the Pope is, is doing sort of a personal apostolate with, with, with this journalist. That's how he sees it. Right? And he's interested in what good can I do for this journalist in that case, which is you know, I, edifying but somewhat problematic from the point of view of governance. Because right? <laughs> obviously, if you're talking to different people, you're going to send different messages. Right? And if everything is, is, everything is understood as a statement of government, then you're going to cause confusion. Uh, there's a there's a trade-off there, right? And and I one of the one of the solutions, as I say, is kind of lowering the level of the value level that's given to a given papal statement. Saying so he can say a lot of different things. Don't take it all as a statement of general principle, etc. However, he is the Pope, and it's going to be hard. To, it's going to be hard, I think, to manage that because there's an enormous attention, not just from Catholics. Uh, one of the interesting things about the situation we're in now is that he's uh, he has. The faithful, who in a certain sense are hanging on his words because they, they have to, they believe they ought to. Um, but now the non believers have tuned in to, to hear what Francis is saying because he seems to be saying things that are new and different and interesting uh, to the, to the, not to the faithful, but to the people of all, of all faiths. So that's an enormous opportunity and a very interesting uh, situation to find oneself in as the Pope at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, but it's it's a, it's a risky situation. That's uh, I think we'll I'll leave it at that. Uh, and I say, any questions uh, you might have, fire away. Yeah. 
it's not like he's coming from a complicated situation in Cuba either before the. <laughs> Um, one of the th obviously there's the there is there is a certain risk, but I think he also has uh, just enormous goodwill on his side, uh, coming from uh, the media itself, right? And that's been very a very positive thing. I think the the the, the media appreciates the ease with which he talks to them. And, and they're they're willing not to you know make you know mountains out of mo molehills. Um, sometimes they they make mountains out of molehills that they prefer. Perhaps you know there's some journalists who, who sort of emphasize things that they think uh, that they wish the pope had said, and they leave out things that the pope also said that might have modified that. And that there's there's a certain bias sometimes, obviously in the media, but I. Don't think uh, he runs a great risk. Uh, I, I I think that the the trip to the United States is going to be a huge success. Uh, and you know, on the other hand, the Pope is, has surprised everyone, and he may say things in those you know, in the, whether it's Congress or at the UN that will will take people aback. One of the things that I think um, it's important to I, mean, I lived outside of the U.S. now for twenty years, and I think. Uh, I live with many, many people. From, I've lived with many people from Latin America, and I spent um, a few months in, in Buenos Aires as well. And is the way the United States is perceived uh, from the outside is very different from the way we see it. And so uh, the, we are acutely aware of, of the political cultural differences here. Uh, we divide up the country in, you know, in different slices and ideologies and whatnot. But from the outside, the U.S. is you know the one big is one big monster, especially from Latin America, and it's the capitalist empire, it's military power, it's you know, and it, I, I, I joke you know from 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 the south to a, to a large extent, I was exaggerating a little bit, but you know, George Bush and Hillary Clinton are both gringo. That's that's how it is, you know, the, and and. There's, there's a certain truth to that. Obviously, we recognize enormous differences uh, between them, and those differences are true, right? But also, there's a certain continuity in the big scheme of things, the way the U.S. behaves and, and the international scene and its general influence uh, in the rest of the world, the, the culture that we export, right? And I think sometimes we think we're, we're ashamed of the things that the, the U.S. exports, right? And, and the, our tendency from the inside is to say, well, it's not coming from me. It's coming from you know, so and so. Well, I mean, that could be the right or the left. I mean, right? We don't want to say that's the U.S., but from the outside, well, sorry, it is. It's that's the U.S. That's what the U.S. gives the rest of the world, and I suspect that we're gonna we're gonna get a sense of that when the Pope speaks, because he's coming from from Buenos Aires, from Argentina, and particularly as an edge, especially the Peronist. Uh, side of, of Argentinian politics, which he kind of comes from, uh, doesn't look at the United States in a friendly way. And I, I suspect that there'll, there'll be a bit of uh, an edge to what the Pope has to say, but the funny thing is, it will probably cut both ways in terms of the internal politics of the United States. You know, he might, he, you know, talking, he, he, he made some comments in the Philippines about gender theory and ideological imperialism, right? But also, there's the stuff about consumerism and you know, or immigration, or it's going to be probably going to step on a bunch of toes. I think that's my. Right. Chris, ah. Uh. Yeah, that's a that's a very complicated uh, sort of dynamic because it's true the Pope has uh, spoken of, of uh, himself as the Bishop of Rome and kind of laid emphasis on that and talked about collegiality and synodality. Um, at the same time, I think um, 
the, I can't say grassroots level, Episcopal level, right? Um, the, there are probably quite a few bishops who say that that's actually not how, it, how he's functioning as pope. In other words, he, he, he probably functions as pope a little bit more like the Jesuit provincial that he once was. In other words, consulting and, and making decisions on his own. Um, even some of the things like the phone calls and stuff that, you know, if you're the bishop in the diocese where the pope makes a phone call to some you know, person, you're, you're put in a hot, you know, that, from an Episcopal collegiality point of view, that's a little ha hard to handle, right? Uh, now what do I do? I say, oh, the pope's wrong, or if, I, if I, he doesn't know all the information, you know, he doesn't know the whole story. I mean, you know, you, if you were a bishop here, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't call him. You know, you know, Chapu wouldn't be you know, making private phone calls, responding to the problems of in other dioceses. You know, um, so in that sense, he's not actually acting like the bishop of Rome. He's acting like the pope, of the, the pastor of the world, really. Uh, which is, I think, uh, and I think it's John Allen, I think, who who said that. And I I think there's a lot there's a lot to that. Uh, that and so it cuts both ways. There, there might be some problems with it, but there's a I think there's an enormous positive side in that, and that people see in him essentially the kind of pastor of the parish that they would like to have. And of course with the, the modern communications and stuff, it's now possible basically to relate to, to, relate to the Pope more than you relate to your, your pastor. Uh, you're, you're, you're listening to the homily that morning in Santa Marta, you can hear it, you can hear it in Italian, you know, but if you know Italian, you're, you get the, the Pope's preaching to you every morning, right? And you, you like him, you see him, you have his picture, and you, you don't have a picture of the local pastor on your wall. Right? <laughs> you know? And so, and the, the, as I say, the, 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 the global village effect of modern communications makes it possible for the Pope to essentially you know, function as, uh, as the local, local pastor for the world. It's very interesting. Fair enough. Forward focus. Constitutes. Right, exactly. Well, those are great, great questions. Um, the first one about aesthetics, that falls, I think, into the category of things that uh, actually are part of the contin uh, a continuum. In other words, uh, more or less continuum. Uh, the real break is John Paul II. Um, it was John Paul II who, who shed a lot of the trappings of the papacy. Uh, and then some of the most surprising things, and people were were very much ready for it, right? But people, I think, we forget now. We're we're accustomed. Many of many of you perhaps weren't even born, right? The uh, when when John Paul came to the papacy to Rome, but his style was so different from the previous the previous popes, including the clothing and, and the the whole the whole style, his uh, use of I. I mean, the, he talked to you know, that there's a the personal pronoun. <laughs> the the manner of John Paul II was, I think, the the, mo the sharpest break. What I, we've seen since then has been 
you know, more or less a continuum. Benedict became a slightly, slightly more, you would say, traditional papal in the fancier vestments, etc., but not much more. Uh, you know, we're still we're still in a in a very modern uh, sort of phase of the papacy, and the, and the the novelty of Pope Francis, say, not living in the papal apartments, uh, driving around in a Ford Focus, uh, the shoes, the, the, the handbag, or what is his, his, carrying his luggage on the plane, those kinds of things, I think are actually fairly, relatively small changes compared to what happened uh, under John Paul II. I think that was the, the big break. But uh, those are forms of communication. I mean, I mean in other words, the, the gestural communication, the way of life, the example that he's setting, um, and it has um, consequences. There's no question, you know, that uh, I, mean, I know, you know, the people working in the Vatican, uh, the Curia, think twice now about uh, you, if anyone's going to buy a car, they're going to think about it. They're, they are, I swear. Every, everyone in the Vatican is thinking, hmm, you know, that's going to look bad. It's going to look like, it's, I have a nicer car than the Pope. I can't, you know, it's got a, it, how, how does that work, you know? And the, and the clothing and all the, the, the whole, the, the example of poverty uh, uh, of the Pope. And, and the, the funny thing is, and he himself has said it, and Pope Francis has said it, it's not as if John Paul II or Benedict were living you know, lives of luxury. And in fact, the papal apartments are, are nothing to, to brag about. Now, the, the building is impressive and all, but if you've ever been up there or seen the pictures inside the papal apartments, Nothing. It's exactly the same level, I would say, as Santa Marta. In fact, Santa Marta is more, more modern, actually. Um, it's not really, and he, and the Pope said, it wasn't about luxury. It was about the fact that there were more people around. And he didn't want to be isolated in the papal apartments. <coughs> Complicated, but I, I think more or less that's 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 true. But it doesn't really matter in terms of the communication, uh, because it's been interpreted as a renunciation of the papal lifestyle. You know, the, the, the not living in the papal apartments has taken on a, a meaning that the Pope himself has denied that it has, but, and it's a good meaning in, in, any, in any case. It's, it's a positive message about simplicity of life, etc. Now, uh, so essentially the, the aesthetics is, is part and parcel of the, of the communication of the Pope and very important. Now, uh, question about his sort of stress on social issues as opposed to the moral issues uh, as, a, as a point of engagement with, with the secular, uh, secular culture. Um, you know, I, I see that in the context of uh, a much broader, this is, a, this is a, another, another lecture, uh, of, um, but it's important, is um, his message of mercy. In other words, uh, he talks about Mercy all the time. John uh, John Allen says, you know, if you have to have one word interpretive key of this papacy, the word is mercy. Uh, it's in his motto. Uh, his, the, the, the motto of the Pope is miserando aque eligendo, you know, having mercy and choosing. And it's about the calling of Saint Matthew uh, by by Christ. Which uh, so there's no question that mercy is at the center of this, of his his own self understanding. And I think the emphasis that he's laying on mercy, I don't think is a strategic decision to like look for the, the common ground and avoid the contentious grounds of moral sexual politics and things. Um, I think that, and th I've, I've reasons to say this beyond you know, just my a hunch, that his decision reflects uh, an analysis of, of the situation where we are today in the world that the real problems uh, of the faith in the 21st century, uh, if you had to pick one, right, what would you, what would you say it is? is? Is it going to be moral issue X? You know, stop that and everything's going to be solved? No, it's, it doesn't work that way, right? And there's abortion, bam, you no. Know? That's not, you know, that's not where the whole you know, game is played. And the real problem facing the world today is basically people don't understand 
who God is, whether there is a God, who that God is, and who am I in relation to that God. We're, we're at a, a much lower level than issue X, issue Y, you know, fix that, and everything is, you know. And the Pope, this is where I say there's, there's good evidence for this, is that he, and he when he was given the, the book of Cardinal Casper called Mercy, right, title of the, the book, the Pope, first, when first seeing the, the cover of the book, Casper tells the story, uh, the Pope took the book and said, ah, the name of our God. Looking at you know, the word mercy as the name of God. And so there's, it really is about, his, his focus on mercy, I think, is a way of saying, what we have to straighten out first <coughs> is a theological identity question. Who is God? Once you've answered who is God, and if you understand God as mercy, then all those moral questions can be addressed in a different light. In other words, they're understood not as an imposition, but as a consequence of God's mercy. In other words, God loves you and wants you to be happy. And the laws, those moral laws, are part of the mercy. They're ways to get to, to, to God and ways to get to your own happiness. They're not a series of rules that are somehow you know, exceptions to the mercy of God, right? This is God's justice or rule, the rule-making God, and then there's the God of mercy over here. You have to understand God is mercy. And when Jesus says, you know, for instance, the, the, the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more, actually that's the voice of mercy. That go and sin no more, is, that's how mercy sounds. Because he loves, he loves that woman so much, he's telling her how to be happy. Because sin is not going to make you happy. And so I think, you have, but you have to understand who you're talking to. In this case, who Jesus is, but who God is, and then the laws can make some sense. Otherwise, you know, you're never going to get anywhere. Just you know, telling people stop that, do don't do that. And it's obviously some people will understand, you know, the arguments of, of natural law and law. You know, you can make a good argument, I think, reasonable arguments for the moral law of the church. But you know, and I think those arguments should be made. However. And I think the overall, the overall picture of who God is, who am I in relation to God, is the one that the Pope wants to set, he wants to focus on that. And then you have a better chance of getting people to listen uh, on the moral question. Right, sure. Well, maybe. I was a speechwriter. <laughs> no crime. <laughs> I remember Brian here, yeah. Well, my own experience uh, writing uh, writing speeches is uh, any indication, you know, those kinds of speeches, say a speech to Congress or the UN, are probably going to be divvied up, uh, and the different specialists will will handle different parts of it. Uh, so justice, justice and peace, obviously, will have uh, I would have imagine will have a hand. Uh, there, I mean, there's there is uh, the different pontifical councils, right? Will have specialists, right? Uh, I mean, people say that Cardinal Turkson wrote a good deal of Laudato Si and things like, you know, that he's head of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Now, the truth is, I suspect it actually wasn't Cardinal Turkson, but his second, you know, uh, who's an American, who probably wrote a, lar a large part of that. The Pope seems to rely a great deal on uh, Victor Fernandez, who's the president of the Catholic University of Buenos Aires, who he made a bishop like the day after he was elected pope. So. <laughs> so clearly a favorite, a favorite intellectual of the pope, uh, uh, Victor Fernandez. Um, within the Vatican, th that's, I, I, I don't know of, uh, th this is a bit of a mystery actually, 
um, who exactly uh, the Pope turns to. As I say, the, the Victor Fernandez is, is in Buenos Aires, right? and they're, they're in close contact. But um, within the Vatican, I don't think, certainly we're not, uh, one of the interesting things about the Pope is he hasn't changed many of the, the dicasteries in the, in the Curia. Many, if not most, uh, are headed by the same people who were there when, when Benedict was Pope. People talk about the reform of the Curia and all, but actually what's most remarkable is the stasis, I mean, the, the, the lack of, of change in the personnel. Just this morning, I was at the cathedral, and uh, I, as we were driving out of the parking lot, we saw Father Guido Marini, Monsignor Mar Marini, who's the, the head of ceremony, the, the papal liturgical ceremonies, talking with Father Dennis Gill of the cathedral, and they're organizing clearly you know, the Pope's uh, the Pope's cer papal ceremonies here in Rome. And we spotted the the, the Guido Marini, but Guido Marini is uh, totally associated with Pope Benedict and the liturgical style of Pope Benedict, and yet he's still there. Right? And then that's true on a, on a number of, uh, num in a number of the dicasteries. There's a, a striking. <laughs> Uh, lack of revolution in, the, in that sense, but getting back to the the, the question, though, I, I I don't know of any. I can't. I couldn't put my finger on anyone particular in the in the curia who is like a, a, a privileged uh, the writer for for the pope. Um, my suspicion is, as I say, I, the Turkson perhaps with Laudato Si, Gau, uh, Evangeli Gaudium. I think is actually mostly. This sounds bad, no, but cobbled together, put together from previous writings. In other words, a lot of Evangeli Gaudium, it's natural enough. You arrive and you have to, you have to publish something. You draw on stuff you've already written. Right? And I think a lot of that is taken from things that the Pope already said in one place or another. And probably those were written, uh, not f hit physically, but probably in, in collaboration with Victor Fernandez in, uh, in Buenos Aires. Sorry That's about it. That. Good. Um, it's late. Sorry. We have a 12:30 commitment, and uh, I think that's going to be good. So you hang out and answer more questions. Sure, on absolutely. Basis, is that appropriate? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs>